when the last we left the ranch, we were uh, we developed uh, Faraday's law. Remember that says that if we have a region where there is a time varying magnetic field, we will induce an electric field. So in the case that I have illustrated here, if we have a time varying magnetic field, time a magnetic field that is increasing, pointing out of the screen, it will induce electric field lines that are oriented as clockwise circles that just close on themselves. They don't start or stop on any particular point because that, that can only happen if there's an electric charge. So this is a different way of making an electric field line. Um, we had also worked out that if we integrate e dot ds, so here I can pick a small path. Here's a differential displacement ds, and I will make my path of integration counterclockwise following an electric field line. We worked out that the integral of E dotted with ds around that path would be equal to the negative of the time rate of change of the magnetic flux going through the path. So we recall this uh, to uh, set up the next issue, which is going back and revisiting Ampere's law. So let's go and revisit Ampere's law. So if you remember there, what we had had at that point is if I had a current I, we had worked out that it would make magnetic field lines that were oriented as circles. Again, not starting or stopping on any point because there are no magnetic charges that we know of. Um, and we had worked out that again, if I integrated over an Empyrean path, so again, here I'll be aligning my ds with my magnetic field. So remember the direction of the magnetic field is given by the hitchhiker rule, the right hand rule using your thumb with the current. Um, we had seen at that point that if I integrated b dot ds around a path, that that was equal to mu naught times the current enclosed in the Empyrean path. Now it turns out that this is incomplete. To see that, oops, sorry about that. Let's visit what I like to call the capacitor problem. So let's just say for the grins that we hook up an RC circuit. So here's a battery. Oops. And let's put in a, whoops. That to excuse me, they've retooled notability on me just a little bit. Um, we'll have a switch that we will be closing. And I have my capacitor right here. Now, once I throw the switch, you remember that in DC, if I have an initially discharged capacitor, so we'll say that Q at time zero is equal to zero. Um, 
the initially discharged capacitor, remember, acts as if it were a wire momentarily. Um, obviously, no current can flow across the capacitor, but since there will be no potential difference, we'll be able to pull max current through the circuit. So the current is going to start out at the battery voltage over the resistance and it will exponentially decay down to zero and our charge will go up from zero to the capacitance times the battery EMF. <coughs> All right, so the question here is if I were sitting, say, right here, this point right here, between the plates of the capacitor, like say just right on the very edge, is there a magnetic field there? I'm going to think about that one for a second and pause the video, think about it, and we'll get back with you. Okay, so here's the issue. If I zoom in real big on my capacitor here, so I'm going to just draw some enormous plates. Oops, that's supposed to erase. All right, there we go. So there's one enormous plate, and let me make it, make it far enough away that we can clearly see both plates. And I'm making the plate square mostly just because I suck at drawing. Okay. So here's our point of interest right here. Now, we could be tempted to use Ampere's law here and say, well, I can go ahead and draw myself an Ampurian path. Oops, let me to like this. I can go ahead and do my integral b dot ds. I'll just pick my ds to go like that. It won't matter. Ampere's law is going to tell me this is equal to mu naught times I enclosed. Well, what's the current enclosed? I might look at that and say, oh, gee, I can look right inside this path here. There's no wire going through here, so clearly it's zero. And that's one choice. So I'll say mu naught times the zero equals zero. Okay. Um, but the situation is a little more tricky than that. You see, here's the thing. In order to determine what do you mean by through, all that vector calculus requires of us is that we imagine a shape, that we imagine any shape that doesn't have holes that is bounded by our Ampurian path. So zero would be the choice we get for this orange surface here. But this isn't the only choice of surface we could imagine. We could imagine instead, uh, let's do purplish here. Um, this one's going to look really awful, again, because of my art. But try to roll with me here. So this is a purplish colored surface here. It's certainly bounded. Um, here, I can make that a little nicer there. Oops. It's certainly bounded by the Empyrean path. And I'm trying to envision this as looking kind of like, say, the 
the baked surface of the top half of a hamburger bun or something like that. So there, the blue surface does not is not share any space whatsoever with the orange surface. Instead, it's looping up and around like a big bubble going around, but crossing through the wire up here. And remember our wire we said was carrying a current I down. Hmm. Alrighty. Well, if I go ahead and do my Amperian path integral, then I get mu naught times I, which is definitely not equal to zero for my purplish path. For, for my purplish surface bound, that's bounded by the same path. Now, in order for math not to be broken, I have to get the same answer either way. So, we've got a problem here. Experimentally, we, we know if we actually go and put Hall probes out there and measure it, experimentally we know it's this. So that's helpful. But we can't ignore the fact that I, the sensible choice of surface to be bound by my Empyrean path to see whether there's a current going through it or not clearly doesn't have a current going through it. So how do we fix this? And this is actually the issue here is we need to fix this somehow. Um, this happens in physics from time to time. Every so often you'll get a statement that's almost right. And it turns out that all you need to do is patch it up by say adding a term or multiplying by a factor or something like that. In this case, we need to it will turn out that we need to add a term. So let's think very carefully about the uh, about our current here and about our capacitor. Is there some quantity in this region here between the plates in the in the orange surface area? Is there some quantity that we could maybe somehow make proportional to the current. If we can, then we can just add that term to it. So I want you to go ahead, pause about that, and think about that for a good moment. Okay. The answer is yes, there is. So let's say this is a reasonably ideal capacitor. So we're flowing our current I onto the plate. Now I'm just drawing more edge on just so I can see better what I'm doing. So we're building up a charge plus Q here, building up a charge minus Q here. And this is going from zero to plus CE. This is going from zero to minus CE. Okay. Now, let's make these plates. If I, whoops, let me back on that. So if I look between this, I might think about the electric field between the plates. Initially, there's no charge on the plates. I mean, there's no electric field. With time, we're going to keep growing an electric field. Now, the thing is, is that the electric field is proportional 
to Q, not to I, but that's not the end of the world, right? I mean, I could, if I differentiate this, that would give me I. I could differentiate this, that would give me E. Hmm, okay, that seems promising. So let's just focus for a moment here on the upper plate. And I'm going to draw it in ridiculously large size. So we're just looking at our upper plate. We're assuming it's an ideal capacitor, so all my charge is depositing along the lower surface. Okay, and our electric field lines are starting at that surface and leaving. Like so. All right, so let's go do Gauss's law. Um, this has planar symmetry. So the surface of choice would be a Gaussian pizza box. Now remember the conventions of physics art. When we draw like this, we usually are drawing in cross section. And so when you see something like this, you should be thinking that's projecting in and out of the screen in 3D. So you're looking at a pizza box shaped Gaussian surface. Okay, so with that, we can start with Gauss's law. In which says that the surface integral of E dot dA is equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Well, this integral is just going to evaluate to E times A, where A is this area of this surface, this piece of the Gaussian pizza box here. Remember the field in here is zero. Here the field is either zero or perpendicular to the area vector. So it's just E A. And the charge enclosed is just Q. Okay. So following that along, I can write that Q is equal to epsilon naught E A. And I can note that E A is the electric flux, epsilon naught phi electric. In this video, we're going to have to be very careful about that. Um, and just keep our electric and magnetic fields fluxes straight with subscripts. Okay. So the current has to be equal to, well, it's dq dt, right? And differentiating that, I get that this will be epsilon naught, because that's a constant, I can pull it out of the derivative, d phi e dt. All right, so going back here, the current in this wire right here is equal to epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the electric flux between the plates. For historic reasons, this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this value here gets called the displacement current, which is an absolutely amazing name except for the fact that it's neither current nor is there being anything being displaced. So other than that, the name is perfect. Um, it, the name sticks around for historic reasons when people were first figuring out how electricity and magnetism worked. Um, they envisioned that the way electricity and magnetism worked, what we would now call the electric and magnetic fields, they were envisioning as vortices in a hypothetical fluid that was called luminiferous ether. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Um, 
this mod, since this is the first and almost the last time you'll have heard the phrase luminiferous ether, you'll hear me mention it again briefly when we talk about special relativity. You can probably guess that the luminiferous ether model got discarded into the ash bin of history, and you would be correct. Um, but the name stuck around. They were kind of imagining swirls of this ethery thing moving between the plates. But it's not actually a thing, but it is a useful illusion to give yourself. So what we can imagine doing is I've got my plates here, and we can say that the wire here and here are both carrying a current I. And now I'm going to be drawing in this purplish color here. I don't want to imply that these are electric field lines, so let me try it like this. And what we're imagining is that you have a current of something. And you may Again, keep in mind this is totally imaginary. This isn't really what's happening, but it's a useful picture for thinking about it. Um, we'd say that this is the displacement current between the plates. So we have actual physical current in the wires here. We have displacement current between the plates. And we say that this displacement current is at all times equal to the actual physical current. Now again, this isn't what's actually happening here, but we're, get, but we're getting close. Um, what is happening here is the time is that we have an electric field that is varying with time. And what we'll be heading toward is that a time varying electric field induces a magnetic field which isn't too surprising since we found that the reverse was true already. So here's how we can patch things up. If we go back to Ampere's law, the um, way that we could patch it up is to say that the integral of B dotted with ds is everywhere equal to mu naught times i plus this hypothetical not doesn't really exist made up displacement current thingy. So if we look here in the region where I did sort of the lilac surface, we've got physical current going through here to the tune of I. In this region here where I did the orange surface, we don't have physical current but now we have displacement current running between the plates. And all that displacement current will pass through the Empyrean path, and we end up with the same um, result, because since the displacement current is equal to the physical current, um, in the one situation, I'll be putting in the physical current and zero for the displacement current. In the other case, we'll be putting in zero for the physical current, but I for the displacement current. Either way, we get the same answer. Okay. So, before we get to the full-blown Ampere-Maxwell law, it might be instructive to see if this predicts anything new, and the answer is it does. So let's go look edge on onto our charging capacitor, like so. All right. So we're carrying a physical current I. And then between the plates, we're going to say that we have this hypothetical displacement current. like so. Okay. Now, what I'm going to envision here is that I'm going to envision that we, that when I draw a side view here, that our eyeball 
is over here and we're looking at it this way. So now I'm going to draw a side view and the side view I'm going to draw is a cross section between the plates. So sorry about that there. So now between the plates what I have is I will have a region Oops, a uniform region of displacement current that's going into the screen. Now, from right-hand rule perspective, we treat displacement current just like we would treat physical current. So take the thumb of your right hand, point it into the screen, and you'll see that we should be getting magnetic field lines that are swirling clockwise. Oops, I do a better job than that. And then we'll start to fall off in strength as we go away. All right. So these are all going around clockwise. And let me demarcate where the actual capacitor is, it's right there. Well, I tried. This line and that line are, well, let me try it a little better. There we go. That's the actual physical capacitor plate right there. It's shadow. Okay, so if I wanted to find the magnetic field strength outside. I would go ahead and pick an Amperian path that follows my magnetic field line. So this is some distance R from the outside. And I could say integral B dot DS equals mu naught times I plus I displacement and the current is zero. And I should also probably say enclosed in the path. But all the displacement current is enclosed in the path, so that's good. And the displacement current is just equal to I, so this will be B times 2 pi R equals mu naught I. And so we get that B is equal to mu naught I over 2 pi R if we're outside the capacitor. And this is perfectly in keeping <coughs> with what we've seen um, for a wire. So that's good. Now let's instead, oops, sorry about that. Let's instead, I'll do it in a different color, um, light green, there we go. Let's instead say I wanted to calculate what this electric, this magnetic field line strength was. Again, I'm choosing an Empyrean path that follows it. We'll still say the radius is, um, let's call it little r. And I'm sorry here, um, I should be calling, oops, this little r as well, here and there. Um, we'll become clear why in a second. r, r, and r. Okay, sorry about that. And let's say the radius of the capacitor is big R. Okay. So let's go ahead and do Ampere's law again. So now, whoops, that's the wrong green. It's that green there. So integral b dot dS 
this will equal mu naught times the enclosed displacement current. But now you see we're not enclosing all of it. So you have to set up a proportion. It's going to be equal to mu naught times the displacement current times the ratio of the areas here. So the ratio of the area inside the Empyrean path to the area inside the capacitor, that ratio is going to tell me the fraction of displacement current inside the Empyrean path. So this will be pi little r squared over pi big r squared, cancel, cancel. Well, again, this will be b times 2 pi r. Now this will equal mu naught times I displacement, but we can say that I displacement is just plain the current I. Um, R squared over R squared, cancel, cancel. If I divide by 2 pi, I get that B is equal to mu naught over 2 pi I R over r squared. Now, at the case where little r equals big R, these two values are the same, and you should convince yourself of that. So everything joins smoothly at the boundary. But what we see is that if I'm outside the region of the capacitor, it's just like a wire. It falls off as 1 over r. But inside, the prediction is the magnetic field is 0, and it increases linearly until I make it to the boundary of the capacitor. And this actually turns out to be the case when we go and stick Hall effect probes in, in between the uh, plates to observe this. Okay. Oops. So with that, that leads us to our restated Ampere Maxwell law. This displacement current correction is due to the Scottish physicist James Clark Maxwell and it is important enough that we will see that the entire system of, well not just this, but his whole, all of his contributions in electricity and magnetism are important enough that the entire system of equations that describe electricity magnetism, of which this is one, um, get called the Maxwell equations in his honor. So what we have is we remember that the displacement current we said was equal to epsilon naught d phi e dt. So I can rewrite this as integral b dot ds equals mu naught times the current enclosed inside my Ampere path plus, now this is the term for the displacement current, we're going to put in that the displacement current is epsilon naught d phi e dt. And this is one of the four key Maxwell equations. All right, so at the moment we have three of the four Maxwell equations. We've seen Gauss's law for electric fields already. We now have the Ampere-Maxwell law and we have Faraday's law. There is, it turns out, a Gauss's law for magnetic fields. So again here, I want you to think for a moment about what that could possibly look like. Go ahead and pause the video and come back when you've got something. Okay. So if we think about what any uh, magnetic field looks like. Or B fields. If you think about what any magnetic field looks like, the one thing that we do know 
is that the magnetic field lines always close in on themselves. So we could imagine, say, I don't know, a bar magnet or something like that. But it's going to make some sort of a dipole configuration like that. Let me, oh God, that looks awful. Some sort of a dipole configuration like that. Let me put in a couple more lines just to clarify that. Okay, and a moment's reflection should show you that if I make any sort of arbitrary Gaussian surface, this is supposed to be an enclosed surface, as many lines have to go in as go out. This is because there are no magnetic charges that we know of. Um, if there are, we, we know how to modify this relationship, but for now we'll just roll with the idea that there aren't any. And so what we get is, since as many lines go in as go out, the magnetic flux going through an enclosed surface that doesn't have any holes always has to be zero. Okay. So, this gets us to the Maxwell equations. We've seen them all, but it's worthwhile to put them all together in one place. So we have Gauss's law for electricity. That one said that the mag whoops, the electric flux through a Gaussian surface is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So what this says is that a way to make a magnetic field, sorry, to make an electric field, is to have an electric charge. It says that field lines can start or stop on electric charges. We just came up with Gauss's law for magnetic fields, and that says that there are no magnetic charges. So I can't make a magnetic, whoops, I can't make a magnetic field line that way. Okay. Then we have Faraday's law. Faraday's law says that for some closed path, integral e dot ds will be equal to minus d phi b dt. So this says that in addition to having electric field lines start or stop on electric charges, another way that we can make electric field lines is we can have a time varying magnetic flux, but those electric field lines will have to loop back on themselves. And then finally we are left with the Ampere-Maxwell law. says integral b dot ds equals mu naught i plus epsilon naught mu naught d phi e dt. So this says although there are no magnetic charges we can think of two way two other ways that we could make magnetic fields. Both of them will make magnetic field lines that just loop back on themselves. One way is we can have moving electric charges. So that is our current term here. The other way is we can have a time varying electric flux. Now notice here, the, my, the plus sign here means that the sense of the magnetic field um, will follow the hitchhiker rule. So think about the direction of the displacement current, put your thumb in the direction of the displacement current, 
that will be the orientation of the magnetic field line. Um, with Faraday's law, we have to use Lentz's law to tease out the direction of the electric field lines. This is an absolute triumph of late 19th century physics. It took the better part of a century to put the whole theory together from the earliest observations to Maxwell putting it all together at the end. Now, a couple things you'll notice is that there seems to be a bit of a broken symmetry here. You might say, well, what if there are magnetic charges? If there are magnetic charges, you know how to cope. We would put a term here, and we would have a term here for moving magnetic charges to make an electric field. But we're going to say that they don't exist because we've never seen them in the experimental evidence and, and the evidence we have available is that if they exist they're so rare that for all practical purposes we can ignore them. All right so there's something else though. <laughs> if you look at this this says a time-varying magnetic field can make an electric field. Well, let's say this is varying in time, like say a sine function or something like that. That would mean that our electric field would look pretty cosine. -y. And then this here says that a time varying electric field would make a magnetic field. Well, we got cosines, and then we're going to have a derivative. So that magnetic field itself would be oscillating. So we can have situations where we can have, if we have an oscillating magnetic field, it'll create an oscillating electric field, which in turn creates an oscillating magnetic field and so forth. This is going to give rise to the electromagnetic wave, which will be the subject of the next class. However, before we go on that, before we go on that, um, I do want to show that maybe there's also even a little more going on than meets the eye. One of the things we'll see in the next class is when we work out the speed of this electromagnetic wave, it'll be 1 over the square root of this number. And it'll turn out that this will pop out purely from considering these laws of physics without regard to who the observer is. So this makes the seemingly crazy prediction that everybody measures the same speed of light. If I'm driving along past you at some significant fraction of the speed of light, and we'll ignore the fact that the impact of my vehicle into the air would cause thermonuclear explosions. Um, if I were driving past you at some substantial fraction of the speed of light, and I turn on my flashlight, and I measure the speed of the light coming out of my flashlight, and you measure the speed of light coming out of your flashlight, we would both have to get the same number. If it makes you feel any better, and it probably doesn't, um, but if it makes you feel any better, we would disagree about the color of the light coming out of the flashlight, so at least there's that. But we would both have to agree that it's going at this speed, the speed of light. Um, which seems to be a very special speed that because everybody agrees on it for light no matter what the source no matter how fast the source is moving this seems crazy but it turns out to be experimentally verified so to give you a little taste for how there might be just a little more going on than meets the eye I had alluded in class that if we have a um, a magnetic field, that 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 I alluded in class that different observers are probably going to have to disagree on what electric and magnetic fields look like, and so this is going to give rise to what's called the Lorentz force law. So here I'm just drawing myself a uniform magnetic field going into the page. Uh, 
Now, let's say that you are, what's a good color for charges? Purple. Let's say you are some positive charge Q moving to the right with velocity V in this field. All right, I want you to just take a moment here. I want you to figure out what direction at this instant this positive charge would be feeling a magnetic force. Okay, hopefully we all agreed that the magnetic force felt would be pointing up. Okay, so now let's imagine, so this was all done from the perspective of some observer, S, that's just sitting here stationary like this. Now let's switch to the perspective of some observer S prime. And this observer S prime happens to be moving with a matching velocity. So this is how we're seeing it in the world of S. Now in the world of S prime, what would, what would they be seeing? They would be seeing a stationary charge And because all observers have to agree on the forces exerted on something, they would also say that they measured the same force on it, even though in their frame, um, they would say it was stationary, V prime equal to zero. Okay. But they have, but they, they still have to see the force. If they don't see the force, then observer S would say, hey, this thing's getting deflected up. And observer S prime would say, hey, no, it's not. And either it is or it isn't, and they'd both have to agree on it. So, what force do you suppose S prime would be blaming, or what, what uh, sorry, what, what physical phenomenon do you suppose that S prime would be blaming this force on? Pause and ponder. Okay, it turns out that the only way that S prime can sit, can argue that this is being deflected since the velocity is zero, the magnetic force is zero. There is no doubt about it. He would say that there's some electric field pointing up. And that this electric field that we're measuring here, E prime, it would have to be equal to V cross the old B. Now you can do similar arguments to transform between electric and magnetic fields. Um, the transformation to figure out, so you can, if there happened to already be an electric field in here, um, then the primed field would be the existing field plus V cross B. Um, the, there is a corresponding transformation between magnetic fields that's much more complicated and I'm just trying to give a flavor here. But in a certain sense, what the Lorentz force law says, um, when we write down, we say that the 
force that some charged particle feels is Q times E plus V cross B. The text suggested that this was just simply adding the electric and magnetic forces together. And as you can see, there's a little more to it than that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be naming it after somebody. A way that we can look at this is to say that to the charge, all forces are, well, some are electric, but diff observers moving at different velocities will disagree on what the electric field strength is. And also they'll disagree on what the magnetic field strength is. Um, so in the regimes that we've been looking at so far, where everything's moving slow compared to the speed of light, keeping the electric and magnetic field segregated was valid. But as things start to move faster, it turns out that we have to be a little more careful and that it'll be more correct almost to say that you are experiencing an electromagnetic field, um, a combined electromagnetic field, rather than an isolated electric and an isolated uh, magnetic field. So, oops, wrong color there. There we go. So all I wanted to do here is just show that there's a little more going on than meets the eye. What we're seeing is that different observers are having different experiences of the electric field around them. But if you remember, our understanding of fields is that a field is a property of the thing called space. So this means that it must be the case that different observers are having a different experience of space. It also turns out that they have a different experience of time, but that will be for a couple of classes from now when we start to build up relativity. So I will see you all in cyberspace soon. Um, catch you later.